Hello and welcome to church. My name is Sam Bleeby and I'm really looking forward to worshipping our God together with you today. Though we're in different places and different times, nonetheless we are together, one in Christ. So let's pray as we begin. Our Heavenly Father, bless our time together. Be at work in our hearts by your spirit to lift up and encourage those who are struggling, to give words and music to those who are joyful, to be growing and shaping us, not just as those who follow you at a distance, but as your children, close and enfolded in your care. We come to you now, Father, and ask for your blessing and grace upon this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Although we're in lockdown here in Victoria, nonetheless, our gospel is not chained. And as a church here in Cranbourne and Turidan, we continue to have a mission to a world that is in desperate need of good news. We're going to begin by singing together. We have a gospel to proclaim. subjects. It is I, Prince Samuel. Did you know that I have been away on holidays and I've discovered the most amazing thing? I am part of the royal family. Yes, your vicar, part of the royal family. It's amazing, isn't it? I think the paparazzi are going to be coming to the door, taking photos, except I won't be able to let them in because it's covid but anyway, I'm, I'm part of the royal family. There we go. And it's not just because I'm wearing a really impressive crown or that I'm wearing this cape, which, by the way, I think is pure gold. Pretty good. And it's not that I've just found out that I am, in fact, Queen Elizabeth II's grandson. No. Actually, it was none of those things. I've been reading the Bible and it says in Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 but when the time had come God sent his son that's Jesus to redeem us so that we might be adopted as his children so God's adopted me 
and he's adopted you, if you have faith and trust in Jesus as well, to be part of his family. That means you can just call him dad. But do you know who God is? He created the whole world, the whole universe, and he's in control of everyone and everything, and that means he is the king. Which means if the king is your dad, you know what that makes you? Makes you a prince, if you're a boy, or a princess, if you're a girl. It makes me and you part of the royal family, a whole church full of people who are part of the royal family. If we follow Jesus, we've been adopted into his family. We can call him dad. Uh, We can call God dad. And that makes us princes and princesses in God's heavenly kingdom. Our next song is a prayer that God would be particularly at work over the next 20 to 30 minutes as we hear his word read and preached. It's a prayer that asks God to speak to us personally, uh, directly, to be at work in our hearts. Let's sing, Speak, O Lord. Today's reading comes from Galatians 3, 26 through to 4, verse 7. For in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptised into Christ were clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. 
For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. My point is this, heirs, as long as they are minors, are no better than slaves, though they are the owners of all the property. But they remain under guardians and trustees until the date set by the father. So with us, while we were minors, we were enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child then, also an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. They say that clothes maketh the man or the woman. And I don't really think that's true. We should never judge a book by its cover. But I do know that we do treat people differently or are treated differently ourselves depending on what clothes they're wearing. So back in the day when I was a lawyer, one time I went out during the lunch break in my lawyer suit and tie and the service I got at the shop that I went to was amazing. Now I went to the same shop on the weekend, this time in my weekend clothes. Now I'd be the first to admit that I am not particularly a fashionista and I probably wasn't looking a million dollars but same people, same shop, and the service was terrible. How we dress affects how we relate to others and how others treat us. And our reading from the Bible today really says the same thing. What we're dressed in radically affects the way that we relate to each other and radically affects the way in which we relate to God. Only this time, of course, it's not talking about clothes, but the one in whom we are clothed. If we have faith in Christ, we are in him. We are clothed in him. And if we are in Jesus, that radically changes how you treat others and how you are treated by them and radically changes your relationship to God. So we're going to look at three points that come out of our Bible reading. Number one, you are in Christ. If you have faith in him and follow him, you're in Christ. Number two, this has radical implications for how we relate to each other. And so the ethnic and social and gender divides are all dissolved. And number three, this has a radical effect on how you relate to God. You're adopted as his child. You're part of the royal family. So firstly, you are in Christ. And this really is the big theme of verses 26 to 29. Paul says it again and again. Have a look at how many times and how many ways it talks about being in Christ. Verse 26. For in Christ Jesus, verse 27, if you are a Christian, you were baptised into Christ and are clothed with Christ. Verse 28, all of you are one in Christ. And verse 29, you belong to Christ. In every verse, Paul is driving home this idea, this one point. So up until this point in Galatians, Paul has been talking about how we're not saved through faith, uh, sorry, through the law or obedience to the law, but through faith. Uh, we're saved not by works, but by faith in Jesus. And now he begins to unpack for us a little bit about what that means. Uh, the wonderful outworkings. And the first is that we, if we have faith in Christ, we're clothed in Christ. Now this is a wonderful picture that Paul uses a number of times in different places in the Bible. Uh, and it points us to what our faith does. So what do clothes do? Well, they, they cover our shame. 
I don't know if you've ever had the nightmare or the stress dream where you've turned up to work or to school in your dream and discovered that you're not actually wearing clothes and you spend the rest of the dream desperately trying to hide or to try and find some clothes and it's, uh, it's feeling exposed and stressed. And it's horrible. Well, from the very beginning in Genesis, uh, when Adam and Eve took the fruit and ate of it, they introduced that feeling of being exposed and of being ashamed. And ever since, as we do things that are wrong and or fail, or we just feel like we're not being the people we were created to be, we experience that same feeling. And God comes and he clothes us in Christ. He covers our shame and we are loved because of Jesus' death and resurrection and the salvation that he brings through faith. And when God looks at you, he looks at his son, looks at his daughter because he sees his son. God has given you his righteousness and his perfection in Jesus Christ to wear. Well, to be clothed in Christ also means uh, that he covers our shame. What else does it mean? Our clothes say something about our identity. They communicate something of who we are. So if you wear a white coat and a stethoscope, you're identifying as a doctor. If I wear combat fatigues, I'm a soldier in an army. If I wear a high-vis shirt, then I might be identifying with tradies. If I wear a suit, I might be a, a professional. Or if I wear a collar, then I'm identifying something about myself and my role as a minister. Our clothes uh, say something about our identity, what group that we're a part of, where we belong, where we fit in the world. Well, if we're clothed in Christ, he is our primary identity. It's as followers of Christ that we know where we belong and how we're to think about ourselves and where we fit in the world. Being clothed in Christ also tells us something about his presence as well. Now, I don't know if uh, during lockdown, perhaps, in the privacy of your home, you're changing things up a bit, but usually uh, we'll be wearing clothes everywhere we go and every day of the week. Well, as we're clothed in Christ, he is present with us, not just on Sunday as we dress up and go to church, but every part of the week as we go to work, as we go to the shops, as we do the extra walking that we've started doing now that it's one of the only reasons we can leave the house. No matter what we're doing, Christ is with you. He goes with you every step of the way. Being clothed in Christ also tells you something about his intimate care for you. Uh, our clothes are the closest of all our possessions. So Christ is not only with you, but close, yeah, enfolding you and protecting you. Uh, in the cold of a Cranbourne winter, uh, clothes actually keep us alive. Well, Christ is our life as he clothes us. So if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you're in Christ. Your shame is covered, your identity is secured, you're held close in the presence of God. And this radically, radically changes the way in which you relate to others and to God. So Paul first speaks of the radical change in how we relate to each other uh, across ethnic and social and gender divides. Have a look at verse 28. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male or female. But all of you are one in Christ Jesus. So firstly, he says there's neither Jew nor Greek. Now, the great divide in the church in Galatia was 
between Jew and Greek. Paul has been spending the whole of the letter up to this point explaining why Greeks don't have to become Jews in order to be Christian. He's saying you are one already in Christ. That doesn't mean that our national differences are unimportant or kind of dissolve or disappear. Uh, we still bring the gifts and the glories of our history and our culture with us into the church to the glory of God. But they no longer divide. One of the wonderful things about our church here is that we have people from so many different parts of the world. It's wonderfully diverse and a fantastic picture of how God brings people no matter about skin, colour or nationality, together as one. No matter where we're from, we are one in Christ. And that means that there's, actually, there's no place for racism within the church. It's too easy to look at the colour of skin and think of yourself as other or fundament, fundamentally different or even, God forbid, better than the other. To politely keep a distance, to not really get to know the other. To think that really what needs to happen is they need to change and be more like me. Well, that's what the Galatians have been doing. And Paul's saying, no, there's no longer Australian or Indian, Romanian or Thai, Sudanese or Sri Lankan, British or Aboriginal. We are one in Christ, brothers, sisters, family. Well, there's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free. The slavery was endemic across the ancient world. And the Bible, the Bible doesn't commend it. Paul encourages people to gain their freedom if they can. He tells people not to go into slavery. Uh, it was a God who brought the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt that inspired people like William Wilberforce to push for the abolition of slavery in the British Empire. So the Bible doesn't commend it, but it was a reality in which these Christians in Galatia had to grapple with. Now, this is incredibly radical. The slave owner and the slave go together to church. But now their relationship has fundamentally changed. They're equal. They're one in Christ, equal in dignity and worth. The social difference is dissolved and that affects how the slave owner and the slave relate to each other. Now, we don't have slavery here in Australia, although slavery does remain an issue within our world and you can find out more. There's a website there you can go and have a look at. But we do have the same kind of social differences, don't we? So it doesn't matter if you've got four university degrees or you're a tradie, if you own a business or you're an employee, or whether you're cashed up or you're poor, none is better than the other. We are one in Christ. We're all equal in dignity and in worth. We honour both. And so we use our gifts and skills that God has given us in the first place to support and help one another. Now, I know that some have lost jobs, and it may well be that in the months ahead, others will lose jobs too. And so I want to say to you now, you are a person of dignity and worth, not because of the work that you do, but because you are in Christ. And I want you to know that we're with you in this as a church, because what happens to you happens to us because we are one in Christ. Well, there's no longer Jew nor Greek. There's no longer slave nor free. There's no longer male and female. 
And so the gender divide is taken down. It's not that gender itself is dissolved. There's a lot of talk about that around uh, at the moment. Gender is not dissolved. The gifts and blessings of each gender remain, but the difference in status, differing ideas of worth are torn down. The people Paul was writing to at this time lived in an even more patriarchal society than we do now. And uh, so this was extremely radical. Back then, uh, women couldn't testify in court. They couldn't own property. And they were considered inferior. They didn't inherit. But Paul says, no. Women are equal in Christ before God. They have the same dignity and worth. They are equally gifted and capable as men. And so we treat each other across the gender divide with respect and care because we are one in Christ. Now, I know these times are difficult and I understand the stresses of so much change that has put pressure on people. The statistics show that, sadly, family violence is up. And I know the church isn't necessarily immune to that. And so I, I just want to say to you now, it's never okay. It's never okay to be physically or emotionally or verbally violent with your spouse. If you struggle with this, there is help. You are one in Christ, equal in dignity and in worth. And so if you struggle with this, uh, there is help. I'll put some websites up for you to go to. If uh, this is an issue, uh, there is help to be had. And I'm always willing to listen and to support you as you grapple with that. Well, we're one in Christ. As recipients of grace, uh, we know that our blessings come unearned and so we have no pride in our race or status or gender. We are all sinners. All of us are sinners, like everybody else. And we're in need of forgiveness of Christ. We are in Christ, equal in dignity and worth. But one in Christ doesn't just affect how we relate to one another. It also affects how we relate to God. And it fundamentally changes the way we relate to God. Uh, this is one of the most beautiful things about Christianity. Chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Well, J.I. Packer, in his classic book, Knowing God, has, writes this. Adoption is the highest privilege that the Gospel offers, higher even than justification. To be right with God, the judge, is a great thing. But to be loved and cared for by God the Father is even greater. You can call God Father. God who is glorious in majesty, infinite in power, perfect in holiness. You can call him Father. In fact, it's even closer than that. You can call him Abba, Dad. Well, I hope your relationship with your father is or was good. Uh, many I know have complex feelings about their fathers because all of our fathers are fallen and uh, fallible people. But you have a perfect father. Uh, one of my children delights in saying that I am their second best dad. And I encourage them to do that because they're right. They have a heavenly father, their very best dad. 
how different our lives would be if we knew in the very depths of our heart and in the depths of our soul that we are unconditionally loved by our fathers. Uh, that they approved of us. That they supported and encouraged us. Well, God, your Father, does. If you have faith in Christ, you are in Him. God, your Father, loves you unconditionally. And He approves of you. He supports you in ways that you may not even see. He speaks His encouragements to you, even now. You're adopted as His children, so at any time, any time, you can call out to Him from your heart, Abba, Father. And as your perfect Father, as your Dad, you'll listen and act. Well, this also has implications for how you see yourself, doesn't it? You are noble. You're part of God's royal family, not the fallen picture of the royal family. You might get through things like The Crown on Netflix or uh, through the papers or magazines. No, you're part of God's family, noble, upright, just and good. You're a daughter of the king. You're a son of the king. Or you're in Christ, and this has implications for how you relate to other people and how you relate to God. The ethnic and social and gender divides are dissolved, and you are adopted as God's child, with all the dignity and the glory that comes of being part of the royal family. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise your holy name this morning uh, for your wonderful presence in the life of your people, not only in our congregation, but all over the world. 
we know that you are active in our lives and uh, uh, that is evident through the fact that uh, we do care for one another and we do uh, have fellowship with one another as Paul said in the spirit because the spirit of God is alive and active and causes us to to join together in worshiping you via this social media opportunity and uh, that's wonderful to be able to to sing praises to you and to uh, uh, pray to you and to uh, uh, show in unity that we are the body of Christ in your mercy Heavenly Father hear our prayer we are mindful of this uh, uh, virus uh, uh, being more active than before and uh, it is uh, 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 an opportunity for us to uh, perhaps be witnesses that uh, that this has happened because of God and this is something that the Lord has allowed in uh, uh, the lives of uh, people all over the world so that they can turn their face on Christ. I know it is not uh, necessarily appropriate for people to only turn to God when they are, uh, when they are uh, suffering or, uh, or when there is uh, uh, something about to happen, but nevertheless, may we all turn our face unto Jesus more than ever before. May the people who don't believe in him begin to understand that there are the powers of the invisible evil who can penetrate our atmosphere and touch our lives in a negative way, in a horrible way, and ultimately with death. Therefore, help us, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray to be ready to meet with our Maker, to be prepared and to uh, uh, trust that the Word of God is true and ultimately it will be fulfilled with the second coming of Christ. But the beginning of those visible events should be uh, 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 like an advertisement for everybody to know and understand that they don't have powers over their own lives. We don't have power over our own lives. The power is with God and therefore help us and help those that are watching by television many, many programs that are, uh, that are uh, uh, shouting and heralding the good news that Jesus is the Savior, that he loves all of us and he is calling us to himself. Heavenly Father, may we be a light in the darkness, may we be uh, uh, prepared to share the good news in these circumstances. In your mercy, Heavenly Father, hear our prayers. And yes, of course, we uh, uh, pray continuously for the world, for the leaders of uh, uh, the powerful nations that are in the position of decision-making, that you will continue to bless them with wisdom and understanding of what it is needed uh, mostly in the circumstances that we live now. We thank you especially for our Prime Minister and the government for being able to contribute towards the welfare of so many people in need, people who lost jobs and people who are not well and people who are uh, experiencing perhaps uh, the tragic outcome of this coronavirus. May these men and women of God be, be strengthened in you so that they continue to lead and uh, be a blessing, uh, as they have perhaps been so far, to all of the people, not only in Australia, but all over the world. We thank you for uh, the ministry here at, uh, uh, at Cranbourne, in our parish, and we continue to pray for good health and wisdom and strength, not only for the volunteers who contribute with music and uh, other activities, but we pray for the pastor, for uh, the vicar, Sam, and uh, his lovely wife and children, that you may help them to be strong and, uh, and uh, protected by this dreadful, uh, from this dreadful virus, so that they, in good health uh, and uh, united as a family, be a blessing to the wider family uh, uh, of uh, uh, the believers here in Cranbourne. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for uh, protecting us and uh, I haven't heard anybody being uh, affected by the virus in our congregation, 
But if there is anyone, may you bless them and strengthen them to come out of it well and, uh, and be a testimony of faith for you. Heavenly Father, uh, help us to continue to uphold one another in love and understanding and being appreciative of uh, 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 what we are in you. And we thank you that you will help us to come to a good end in this situation. And may we now join together in the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Apostle John wrote that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he who is Faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You might remember from Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son saying, I will go to my father and say to him, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Well, let's follow his example as we say together this confession. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have broken your holy laws and left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, Forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, in the story of the prodigal, even as the son is confessing, the father has run towards him and embraced his son. And so I say to you, Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness, to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Sinless Savior died, my sinful 
perfect, spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. Was with it still, I cannot die. My soul is purchased with his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior. today. As we close, let's pray together. Eternal God and Father, by whose power we are created and by whose love we are redeemed, guide and strengthen us by your Spirit, that we may give ourselves to your service and live this day in love to one another and to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, it's because we are in Christ that we can live in love with one another and to God as our Father. Well, I pray that truth may go with you uh, throughout this day and this week. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.